Praise God. Why don't we welcome everybody from all of our locations, but no matter where you are today, we want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to the house of God. So it really is good to be beaming into all of our locations today as we come around the Word. And I've got a feeling this Word is going to encourage not only you out there, but you in here. See, that's what we're talking about. Rowdy in the house of the Lord. This is awesome. A few weeks ago, I spoke a message simply entitled, entitled Own the Wells. Everyone say, Own the Well. Own the well. Everyone out there, Own the well. Own the well. Praise God, I can hear you from in here. That's awesome. The message itself revolved around when Jesus went to the well and, and spoke to the woman there, the Samaritan woman, spoke to the Samaritan woman, talked about all things that, that, that were related to her life and talked about living water. She came for natural water, but she got introduced to living water. From there, she went back into the city. And how many of you know the city was transformed as a result? Now, some of you are like, did you say transformed? I think I did. <laughs> Praise God, I need a little bit more water myself. And so, so but, but the point was, Jesus went and owned the well. Everyone say, owned the well. <laughs> we are called to be a people who own the wells. Wherever we go, let's own the wells. Now, at the end of the message, I said I'd follow it up with a message about how to go and engage people at the well, because that's what we want to do, isn't it? We want to actually step outside and we want to go and own the wells. I don't necessarily believe that most Christians have a, an issue with not wanting to share their faith. I think most Christians do want to share their faith, but they really just don't know how to do it. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to go about it. So here we find ourselves. So we're going to go here today. Now, not for a minute am I going to stand up here and tell you that I'm an evangelist, because I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm an evangelist, but this one thing I do believe, I am called to do the work of an evangelist. You might be like, is that because you've got a microphone in your hand and you're a pastor of a church? No, 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 no. It's because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm a believer. If I'm a believer, I'm called to do the work of an evangelist. Paul said to Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, he says here, but you keep your head in all situations. Everyone say, keep your head. Keep your head. Turn the person beside you and say, I like your head. <laughs> so you get to keep it. You've got to keep your head. Brothers and sisters, in all situations, in all seasons, can I encourage you today to keep your head. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. So Timothy was actually a pastor. He's not an evangelist either. He is a pastor, but his pastor, Paul, is encouraging him to do the work of an evangelist. Now, as we go here today, I know there are some people in this house, some people in our other locations that are getting really, really excited. You're like, come on, let's go here. Let's go here. We want to do it. We're called to do it. We know this is what we, we're, we're meant for. We understand that. But at the same time, maybe within the same people, maybe your heart is beginning to beat a little bit faster right, even right now at the talk of it. Maybe your, your palms are getting a little sweaty. And it's like, so you find yourself in this space of, of, of let's go, but being really honest, the thought of actually stepping out into the world and doing it, doing something, well, it makes you a little bit clammy, if you know what I'm talking about. Anyone here know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right, we're all in it together. We get it and we understand it. So, a little bit of motivation. I, I, I think motivation is good. It, it, you know, you, you can't, what, what's, what's, what's uh, the proverb? It's not a spiritual proverb, but it's another proverb. It says, uh, uh, you, 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 what is, what's, the, what's the one about that? What's the one about the horse in the water? And uh, you, you can't get a, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. But how many of you know if you put salt in its mouth? Huh? A <laughs> little bit of motivation goes a long way. I'll give you a little bit of motivation. How many of you are glad, are glad for John 3.16? Give me a wave. You're glad for John. Yes, look at you. Yes. All right. Are you glad for John 3.16? How many of you actually believe John 3.16? All right, all right. So we're glad for John 3.16, and we're saying we believe in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Here we go that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The reason that you and I are so glad for John 3.16 is because as believers who believe in Christ, we have life. Amen? Yes. 
we have life, both in this life and the one to come. But this verse, even though it's the most well-known verse on planet Earth, in the church and outside of the church, this verse isn't all good for those who don't believe. (laughs) It's the other side of the coin. It's the other side of the sword. For Scripture tells us these people are perishing both in this life and in the life to come. So we love it, we believe it, but how much do we really actually believe it? So what do, we, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? If we believe this to be true, what, what are we to do with the verse? You know what we need to do? We need to do something. We need to go and own the wells. Everyone say, own the well. We need to go and own the wells. In Romans chapter 10 from verse 14, it says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is what the scriptures mean when they say, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Praise God. Why don't we turn to this person beside us and say, you've got beautiful feet. (laughs) Now, let's not get weird in here. Let's not get weird. We're talking about gospel, gospel feet. Praise God. All right. You've got beautiful feet. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, I was, I was, reading, I was reading this passage this week in much of my daily reading, and, and this verse jumped off the page at me. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, but we continue, what do we do? We continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, and so I speak. I believed in God, And so I speak. This is not a ministry verse. This is a believer verse. Are there any believers in the house today? If we believe John 3.16, then we have to speak. Everyone say speak. Speak. Then we have to speak. I don't know about you, but I can't help but speak. I can't help myself. George is like, do you have to be so loud all the time? And I'm like, I'm not being loud. I just, I'm excited. I've got to say something. I've got to tell somebody. Yes, I speak. I do speak and I will not stop speaking. (laughs) As in, I was in the shop this morning. I was in our cafe this morning. I say it's our cafe. Like I said, I own our cafe. (laughs) That's my cafe. The owner is at one end. I'm probably two thirds of the way up right in front of the, the kitchen. And the owner from that end yells out, what's today's message? You asked for it. So off I went. I talked about owning the wells. I started yelling out, you've got to own the well. What do you mean? Well, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to preach Jesus. And then there's, there's pastors coming in from another church, and they're like, yeah, let's do this. Praise God. It's like, it's like you've got to own the well. You've got to speak. I believe. I, I speak because I believe. I'm not in ministry. Because I speak, I'm not speaking because I'm in ministry. No, I speak because I believe. believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God. I believe He came from heaven to earth. I believe He lived a sinless life. I believe He died and went to the cross and paid for my sin. I believe on the third day, God raised Him from the dead. I believe He's now seated in heavenly places. I believe He's given me the Holy Spirit. Praise God. He's given me the Holy Spirit. That I might, that I might, that I might, that I might, I might speak. Speak, you gotta speak. Try and stop me. <laughs> I gotta speak. Can't help but speak. I've got good news. I've got to speak that they might have a choice. Let's get real practical today. How many of you want to get practical? How many of you want to own the wells? of the towns and the cities and the nations that we are a part of. Let's own the wells again. Let's own the wells again. Jesus said to Peter, come follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Guaranteed. You follow me? I'll make you a fisher of men. That's what Jesus said. There's so much there. So let's talk fishing around the wells today. Let's just talk about it. That that we might go fishing in the wells of our own lives. Now, as we go here today, you'll hear me processing I'm all the time thinking about, who am I speaking to? I have an opportunity to speak into that 
cafe this morning and most Sunday mornings because I get asked the question. So if they're going to ask, I'm going to speak. I'm going to keep. They know who we are. They know who we are. Like they know who we are. They know who all the enjoyers are that go there. They know the connection. But 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 I haven't gone in there without thinking about my relationship with them and the journeying with them that will happen. It's not like that. So when I'm thinking, I'm all the time thinking, is this a slow cooker or is this a microwave situation? How many of you know when you cook, you're going to see the slow cook? I love it when Georgie puts a roast in the slow cook and then you pull it out and oh, it melts on your tongue. And the microwave, while it cooks, it's not the same as a slow cooker, but it gets the job done too. Uh, in fishing terms, we could... We could liken it like this, and there might be some photos going up. We have the fly fisherman. So you have a fly fisherman, which is like, he's just out there, very precise, looking for that fish. Or you have the dynamite. <laughs> now, legally, legally, I wouldn't recommend dynamite. But it's, a, it's meant to be a picture, an analogy. We can use a fly fishing approach, or we can just... Blow it up. How many of you know there's time and place for both? RSPCA, forgive me. All right. It's an analogy. It's not real. But you get the point. So when you're thinking about the wells and owning them, think about those, okay, is this a microwave? Do I need to microwave this? Or is this a slow burn? The first well we need to own is the friendship well. How, how many of you remember what it was like when you got saved? All right. Were you surrounded by friends that didn't know Jesus? <coughs> you got, you, you, you're already closing down, aren't you? It's like, it's like, I don't know that I want to go here today. Were you friend, surrounded by friends that didn't know Jesus? All right. Many of you still are surrounded by friends who don't know Jesus. You're traveling and you're still creating friendships. And All right. So, But when I got saved, I was surrounded by friends who didn't know Jesus. March 28, 1987 is when I was rushed to hospital after a very bad night. And that was the night that I met the Lord. As I know I met the Lord. I'd grown up in the church. I, I had, had encountered God, no doubt about that, probably five times supernatural, super powerful in my teenage years, but I'd never given my life to Him. On March 28, 1987, my whole world went upside down. I was unconscious, and in my unconscious state, I encountered Jesus. So my mate, my best friend, his name was Ricky Zago at the time. Well, <clears throat> Rick was one of the guys, two guys that, that rushed me to hospital on that night. And so they, they rushed me into hospital. Rick's there. Another guy called Dale is there. And so they, they, they take me into that place. Rick and I, <laughs> all right, this is Rick over here. <laughs> all right. So, so that is us in our high school days. We, we did everything together. We grew up, we went to high school together. Uh, after, after high school, uh, we moved back to Melbourne. Rick was a carpenter, like our Lord and Saviour, by the way. And so I was a carpenter. And so my dad was a carpenter. And so we were all working together. Rick was living with us. We were, we were doing work together. We're living together. Uh, we're drinking together and we're stinking together. The whole thing was done together. That was our life at that point in time. So Rick drove me to hospital drunk. But when he brought me back, he wasn't drunk, I was drunk. <laughs> when he brought me back, I was a Jesus freak because I'd encountered God. How many of you know when you believe, you've got to speak? If you don't know what you don't know, you don't have any responsibility. Friends, if you're here today and you're not a believer, you don't need to do anything because you don't believe. But when you believe, everything changes. So we get out of hospital in Aubrey, we come back to Melbourne. Rick's living with us and working with us, and I'm now a Jesus freak who loves my friend, loves my friend. So what do I do? Every day, I'm telling him about the love of God. From 5 a.m. in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, he's hearing about the love of Jesus. And he's hearing, if you don't repent, you're going to hell. Do we, do we still believe the gospel? Yes. How, how many of you know what it is to be saved? Yes. Saved from what? Yes. Hell. We don't want to talk about hell anymore. We want a gospel without hell because that offends people. Yes. 
also going to burn people. We can't take the hell out of the gospel. That's why it's gospel hell. <laughs> it's the good news of the gospel hell. It's a get out of jail free card because someone paid the price for us. So now, now Rick is trying to go to sleep and I'm telling him, Rick, Rick, this is what God's done for me. He can do it for you. And he's like, shut up, Shane. I'm like, Rick, you've got to give your life to Jesus. Now, so every day at work, every night, he can't get away for probably another six weeks. And after six weeks, he'd had enough. We're at work one day. He pushed me backwards into a trench. He jumped on top of me and punched me in the face. I still love you. <laughs> still love you. And so he gets up and he goes, I'm going home. So he, I thought he was going home. He went home, packed up and went back to Albury. <laughs> he was gone. He was gone. But he still loved me. He loved me enough to be my best man. Uh, uh, when we got married, Georgie and I got married. There we are. That's him with his tongue hanging out. Who knows? Maybe he's from the islands. I'm not too sure. So, I got you, bro. I got you. All right. So, so here we are. So, uh, how long is that? I don't know. That's probably 18 months later. That would have been the case. Then about a year after that, a year after that, let me ask you a question before we go on. Why don't we want to tell our friends about Jesus? I know we want to, but why don't we? Tell me if I'm wrong. Is it because we fear what they will think of us? Do you think that would be the case? We, we want to, but we're just scared. What's this going to do to our relationship? What, is, what will they think of us if I tell them what God has done in my heart? Can I ask you a, a question? If they end up in hell and you haven't told them, what do you think they will think of you then? I know we don't want to talk about this, but we need to. Because life is long and life is short for us all. So we need to speak to our friends about the good news of the gospel. <laughs> the good news. Well, Georgie and I get married. A year after that. So now we're in 1990. I got saved in 1987. Almost three years after I get saved, Georgie and I are at home. We used to have these things on walls called telephones. Remember back in the day, there was a, there was a handle and a, this, and it was like, it was like <coughs> old school, I know, for some of you, telephones. The telephone rings at 1 a.m. on Sunday morning. Ring, 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 and it kept ringing, kept ringing. So I jump out of bed, I do the dash into the, into the kitchen, because that's where the telephone always was at the bench, and it was like, hello, and Rick's, Rick's there, and he goes, what have you done to me? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I can't get drunk anymore. I can't womanize anymore. I can't do all the things I used to do anymore because you're in my head. <laughs> oh, it was awesome. And I'm like, fantastic. <laughs> so we start talking for about an hour. Then we hang up. A week goes by. Next Sunday morning, 1.30. Ring, 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 ring. Sit out there in my jocks again, sitting up on the, on the, on the counter. Talking to Rick about the love of Jesus. Hang up. A week later, three, third week, Rick's on the phone again. So I'm like, I said, Rick, if I come to Albury next weekend, will you come to church with us? He's like, if you come to Albury, I'll go to church with you. So I promise you, before the altar call was even complete, not even wait, you know, you know when people put their hands up? Before the altar call was done, Rick's hand is in the air. Well, long story short, here we are now. That was 1990, so 32 years later. Rick is now the senior pastor of the church. Oh. Praise God, which is a good story. He's pastoring the church. <clears throat> long story, but he's the pastor. And on we go from there. So now there's two of us. <laughs> now not one person speaking, but two. It's a long story short. Rick's in church, Rick's growing in God. Georgie and I moved back to Albury in 1990, a few weeks after that, actually, two months after that, we moved back to Albury. And so Rick and I start working together on the job scene. It wasn't long before we were fondly known, fondly known by most as the God Brothers. The God Brothers. How many of you know now there's not one Jesus freak on the side, but there's two Jesus freaks on the side. So what do we do? We start telling everybody about Jesus. All right. So we're on our way. We're telling everyone about, about the Lord. Amazing, amazing. 
And so I think about those times with such fond memories. I, I, when, I was, when I was talking about these stories this week, I don't know where to start and where to finish with them. I remember one day, though, I say known fondly by most because not everybody appreciated it. As in, it's interesting how, how people think they can treat you, but you don't have a right of response. So some of the guys who were mischievous little ratbags, they would come in and they would put their pornography on the walls in the, in, where we were working. And they didn't like it when we got our spray cans and put bras and <laughs> things on people because they, they said we ruined their pornography. And I'm like, well, flip and take it down. As in, you don't have to put up with that rubbish, you know what I'm saying? If they want to get, so we kept, but some of them complained to the supervisor because we spray painted clothes on their pornography. And so, long story short, the supervisor, he came and said, he said, okay, this is what we've got to do. You've got to stop talking about Jesus. And we said, well, we're not going to stop talking about Jesus. As in, if the issue is that, just tell them to stop putting their pornography up in our workplace and we won't have an issue. And he said, the issue isn't that. The issue is you're talking to everybody about Jesus. We don't want you talking about Jesus. So you either stop talking about Jesus or you have to leave. We said, okay, if that's, if that, if that's where it's at, that's fine. Okay. So we started packing up because that's what you would do, isn't it? We just started packing up. And he's like, what are you doing? And we're like, well, you've told us clearly we're going to stop talking about Jesus or we need to leave. We're leaving. And he's like, you can't leave because you're our best carpenters. Like, and the painters always want to follow us. And it's like, if we can't talk about Jesus, we're leaving. He said, okay, do me a favor. Just tone it down. <laughs> just tone it down. You don't have to leave. Just tone it down. And we said, okay. But we never toned it down. <laughs> Not for a minute did we tone it down. And then this guy called Sam Marotta comes in. This is Sam here. This is yesterday. This is his response to me yesterday. Sam Marotta comes in and his life is upside down. How many of you know at your workplace, your well, you've got men and women all around you whose lives are upside down? Lives are upside down. His life was upside down. He comes in. Well, long story short, obviously, we, <laughs> there's two of us now, armed and dangerous. We start talking to him about Jesus. Well, one week goes by, two weeks go by. By about the third week, we're on the job site and he gives his life to Jesus. As you can see there, actually... Yeah, you can give God praise for that. Praise God. So, so I messaged him on Messenger and I said, hey, Sam, am I, am I remembering right? Because it's now 30 years ago. It was it on the job site that we actually prayed with you. And as you can see there, he says, yes, it was definitely on a work site in Wodonga when you and Pastor Ricky, praise God, there you go, where you and Pastor Ricky were working for David Sanders Holmes. Uh, I certainly will never forget that memorable day, memorable day and it goes on from there. It's amazing. And you know what? To this day, he is still in the same church serving Pastor Ricky and, and has been one of his most loyal and faithful armor bearers. And he's still there to this very day. And so you just don't know, do you? You speak to your friends. You speak on the, in the workplace. You just don't know how God is going to use it. Friends, I'd encourage you, when it comes to the workspace, yes, we need to be wise. But can I encourage you, don't be intimidated. A lot, a lot of the time when I hear people talking about being wise, it's actually intimidation. They're intimidation, in, intimidated to speak because they don't know what the consequence is going to be. Well, praise the Lord, there's no lions that need feeding here in Australia, so let's go for it, you know what I'm saying? Let's just be bold and courageous, be wise, pick your moments, but then step out by faith. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, so then we go to our third well. All right, so you might say, okay, where's the third well? The, the third well, as I, as I finally catch up with where I'm at here, are, are the local wells. So they are the cafes, the restaurants, the pubs, the clubs, the schools, the places that we, that we frequent either once or regularly. And you've got to think about, as you step into these spaces, is this a microwave moment or is this a slow burn? So in my cafe in Carolina Springs, the cafes there that I go to, it's a slow burn because I'm seeing them every day, <laughs> pretty much every day. He said, man needs latte, praise God. So I see them every day. But there's some cafes I go into that I'm in there once, I'm going to meet these people once. I'm going for it. I'm like, not the hand grenade, but we'll call it the microwave. We're just going to turn it up and go for it. And so I remember going to the GPO when we were planting all those years ago in Bendigo. We went to the GPO one night and the server came up and I said to her, as anyone who's been to cafes with me will, would have heard this, 
you would have heard me say, hey, did I see you in church on Sunday? <laughs> now, you might be like, you say that to everybody? Yes. Sometimes I've had people say, oh, Pastor Shane, I'm sorry, I haven't been for a while. <laughs> and I don't even know who they are. <laughs> but usually they're either going to say, I don't go to church, so straight away, there's my opening. Why? As I, I'm, I'm in there. Or I have the opportunity to go wherever. Now, there was a lady on this particular night whose name was Anesu. Anesu came up and I, hey, didn't I see you in church this morning? And she goes, no, but my husband and I are looking for a church. So how many of you know she found her church that night? For the next seven, eight years, she was very much, and her family were very much a part of Enjoy Church Bendigo until they, until they went to Queensland. Why would you go up there? You know that beautiful one day, perfect the next, it's a load of rubbish. Look at all the floods up there, whatever. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, friends, I want to encourage you, you just don't know who is looking for what when they walk up to you. You might be like, but they're there to serve me. No, you are there to serve them. You are there to serve them and you get to pay them for the privilege. How many of you know? How many of you know? If you haven't paid, they're not going anywhere. They're going to sit there, stand there, and listen to everything you've got to say. Why? Because they want to be paid before, <laughs> before you leave the restaurant or they go away. All right, let's move along. What about number four? The fourth well, the service well at the dentist. How many of you know when, when someone's got utensils in your mouth, they're not going to leave you? So talk to them about Jesus. <laughs> When you're at the hairdresser, how many of you know? They're not going anywhere. They're going to get paid. They're just like, you have got an audience. You don't need to leave. Well, they don't, you, you don't need to worry about what's going to happen here. Just tell them about the love of God. Oh, oh man. I, I, think about, I think about the day that I went to the, the petrol station and Tina was behind the counter. I went and got my petrol because that's typically why you go to a, a petrol station this Tina here, Tina and Fabian, and they're beautiful children. And so Tina's behind the counter. I walk in and, and she looks at me and she goes, Pastor Shane. And I look at her and then I look for a tag and I go, Tina, because the name tag. Name tags are cool. We all should have name tags. Anyway, you agree. Praise God. All right. So, so Tina. And so, so I'm like, Tina. Now, I didn't know Tina. I don't, I don't know who knew Tina. Obviously, some people did, but... I'm like, I'm like, Tina, are you part of Enjoy? And she goes, yeah, but we haven't been. You know, it's like, uh. I said, are you, are you okay? Are you okay? Let's slow down enough to a pace where we can actually ask people if they're okay. She just told me where she was at. I said, Tina, if I, if I was to come and visit you and your husband, do you think it would help? And she lit up like a Christmas tree, just like that. And, and she goes, yeah, it would help. I think it would help. So I went and had coffee with Tina and Fabian. Wasn't long after that, that we had Indian food. Praise God. So hot, I couldn't speak for a week. <laughs> My lips felt like they were burnt off. Praise God. <laughs> My tongue was swollen all week. But anyway, it's beside the point. How many of you would agree that Tina and Fabian, uh, uh, one, if, if they're not the most loved couple family in the life of our church, they're right up there. Would you agree with that? I love you guys. Love. Love. Slow down. Do what you got to do. Now, they already had a faith. So we're we fishing for people without faith or they weren't, they weren't, I don't think, I don't think I'm speaking unkindly with you, where you, who you've become, it's amazing. Just take the time. Own the wells, which takes me to the last well. The last well. What's the last well? The fifth and the final well today is, going to sound a strange well. This is a strange one. You're not expecting me to go here. Is the foyer at church. The foyer at church. We have 16 locations and every location has a foyer space of some sort. Can I encourage all of you to own the foyers? Well, why do we say at Enjoy Church, no one stands alone? Why is that so important? Because every week there are people like Rick, 
people like Sam, people like Tina, who are a bit parched, who are a bit dry, a bit thirsty, looking for the waters of life. And they swim in to church. Some are dragged into church. Some find their own way to church. Some get lost. Some are doing nasty deals out there in the street and end up coming in. All sorts of realities. However they end up here, they end up here. But they're in the foyer after church. Can I encourage you, all of you, let's own the foyers. Because there are men and women out there, just like you were, that are looking for an encounter with Christ. And what I found, my encounters with Christ often are in, often happen in the context of the body of Christ. Now, friends, I want to encourage you. There are people here today, maybe in this service, maybe in the services that I'm speaking into, and you've come to church and you're thirsty, you're dry. Can I encourage you, allow the living water to come your way today? Can I encourage you, allow God to come into your life today? And maybe you're here today and... And you're like, oh, I don't know about this, friends. Can I encourage you? Just lean in and allow God to speak to you. But I want to encourage every enjoyer to be on mission every Sunday. I'd encourage every enjoyer, don't be thinking you're going to run out of church every week as soon as the bell goes, ding, that's like, we're out of here. This is not like a Grand Prix where we all head off straight after church. No, 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 no. For us, our church, for me, if you know, if you know week in, week out, I'm one of the last people to leave the building. And it's like, why is that? Because there's people here. The body of Christ is here. I want to encourage you, when it comes to after church, be in the foyer and let's own the foyer. Three things. Now, this is gonna, I'm going to spit these out, all right? Boom, boom, boom. Here we go. So how do we engage? These three things. Just remember these three things. When you're speaking, because you don't know what to speak. Here we go. One, invite them to church. Just invite them to church. You can do that. You can say, hey, I go to a great church. Why don't you come along? Hey, we've got, we got Bloom on tonight. Why don't you come to Bloom? Hey, we've got Covenant Keepers on. Why don't you come to Covenant Keepers? We've got someone on this three-day conference. Why don't you come? Whatever it is, just invite people to church. Point number one, invite the church. Point number two, tell your story. You've got a story and it's worth telling. I, 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 love, the, I love the guy that was, was crippled and Jesus heals him and, and then the, the Pharisees are giving him a hard time and, and he's like, Look, I don't know. I don't know about this and I don't know about that. All as I know is I was crippled, but now I can walk. That's all I know. You've got a story. All I know is I was lost, but now I'm found. Praise God. You've got a story. Tell your story. And the third thing is, ask this question. What can I pray for you for? What can I pray for you for? It's like, wow. You can actually ask people that. I can promise you. In all the years I've been in Christ, I have never been knocked back when I've asked an individual, hey, is there something I can pray for you for? Not once have I been told to go away. Not once have I been told to nick off. Every time people have opened up their hearts and shared sometimes things that were crazy. It's like, I wasn't expecting them to go there. But let's pray. Praise God. So you don't need to pray for them there in the moment because that may not be appropriate. But just guarantee them, promise them, I'm going to pray for you for the next week or whatever it is in regarding, in regarding the situation. So now you know, microwave, slow burn. Am I going to see you every week or once off? The girl in Bendigo, I was only going to see her that night, then I was gone. So I've got, got to ask you now, where do you go to church? That's the other one I ask. Where do you go to church? And they say, I don't go to church. I'm like, praise God, let's talk about that. Straight in. They're the, two, they're the two things. The microwave, slow burn, fly fishing, dynamite. In the three areas, very simple. Just invite, tell your story. What can I pray for you for? Praise God. I'm going to pray for you. How many of you want me to pray for you in all our locations? We're handing back to you right now. Come on, let's give it up for our locations, shall we? West locations. God bless you. Have a great day. Location pastors, take it away.